The Kingston Penitentiary, or KP, is a National Historic Site of Canada, and before it was closed on September 30th, 2013, it was known as one of the oldest prisons in the world to still be in continuous use. Built advantageously upon the northeastern shores of Lake Ontario, with access to an abundance of fresh water and fine limestone, KP soon developed a widespread reputation for its structure and leadership, earning a tribute from the one and only Charles Dickens himself. Visiting in 1842, the literary genius said, There is an admirable jail here, well and wisely governed, and excellently regulated in every respect. But through a long and rich history, the penitentiary has also developed a controversial legacy for notorious escapes, cataclysmic riots, and a variety of cruel punishment practices. The following interview explores KP's colorful legacy by delving into a fascinating book titled The First 150 Years, co-written by former wardens and manager of communications Andrew Graham, Lewis Kelly, and Dennis Curtis. These three figures played a pivotal role in preserving the artifacts and history of the prison, making it heard that both its tragedies and marvels must be remembered. The footage of the interview, which takes place at the Royal Tavern in Kingston, Ontario in 2012, was lost in a hard drive crash but miraculously recovered five years later to become a compilation of inside coverage, archival photographs, and breathtaking aerial videography. The KP Way is a hard experience to put to words. You'll have to see it for yourself. I was 12 years old when I shot my dad He was lying drunk in bed I pulled his gun from beneath his pillow Put five rounds in his head I got six long years at the training school Every night was filled with dread When I got out I robbed a liquor store I shot that owner dead I got 15 years at the big house That's where I belong I don't know no other life, I don't know right from wrong I'm doing time at the big house, they say I'm here to stay They're gonna try rehabilitate me, the solitary way When I was 28, only short time left, a screw got in my face I used my fist, beat them half to death, now I'll never leave this place I try to keep my anger down, but don't invade my space I got nothing left to lose, cause I'm a hopeless case Hi, I'm Dennis Curtis, I've lived in Kingston since 1957 And uh, many years ago now, I've been retired 22 years But I was lucky enough to get a job with Corrections As the Regional Manager of Communications I was the the voice of corrections for the Ontario region. Because of that, I got involved in all sorts of fascinating things, including being a co-author of this book, Kingston Penitentiary, the first 150 years, with my two co-authors and good friends, Andrew Graham and Lou Kelly. All yours, Andy. Andrew Graham. I was the, uh, I've been in, was in corrections for 22 years of my government career. I was the warden of Kingston Penitentiary. We started the book, the whole idea, concept. When I was the warden, we actually completed it at that time. Then the recognition that the 150 was coming up. Hi, I'm Lou Kelly. Uh, I'm a, uh, or I was, I should say, a career corrections person. I retired after uh, 32 years. At the time that we wrote the book, I was the EA, but I held various positions in the service, including warden of Melhaven, warden of Borkworth, um, Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Operations. Inspiration for the book. What seemed like useless junk to some turned out to be an essential collection of KP's history, which is where it all begins. The Assistant Warden Technical Services was basically clearing out attics of material, rolling away all kinds of artifacts because they were useless junk that didn't belong in a, mm -hmm. in a, in a working penitentiary. I just, just went ballistic and said, you know, we're going to save this stuff. This stuff has to be saved because it's, it's historical documents because mm -hmm. it just happened to be kind of Yeah, it would have been thrown out. This is and, priceless uh, stuff, yeah. which is now in the Kingston Penitentiary Museum, by the way. We launched the museum when I was the Deputy Commissioner of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once again, that's where you go and find a few bucks. You find somebody and get the thing going. A place like Kingston Penitentiary 
is like any other institution. It's a living thing. And we, we certainly realized very quickly because the internal architecture just drives it home very, very quickly. We wanted to pay homage because it's always reinventing itself. And so we were presenting stories that sort of reminded people that, you know, these things had happened before, these tragedies had happened before, these good things had happened before. And there were solid people working there. Why Kingston? Why was a penitentiary built in Kingston rather than a myriad of other potential locations? Ottawa, Hamilton, London. Why was KP in Kingston and not Hamilton? Because Hamilton was the other choice. The reason it was built here was to support the military presence. And they would hire the inmates at the rate of one shilling and sixpence per day per convict. Of course, the convicts never saw any of this money, of course. Every mailbag in Canada was made and repaired yeah, in Kingston Penitentiary for many years. Local businesses who said this isn't fair. One and six was per day per convict, mm -hmm. and you're going to supply the building for these people to build this stuff. And so there was so much of an uproar about that that they deal away with the contract. Prison escapes. Daring prison escapes were few, and even fewer successful. However, the inmates who found themselves on the other side once again became a part of KP's folklore forever, including one who actually broke into the prison. Not too many people have broken out of the prison, but only one person we know about broke into the prison. And I forget the date, but his name was Thomas Harvey. And he finished serving mm -hmm. a three-year sentence. Oh, yeah. He went back in. Yeah, for... for theft or something. He was only 16 and he was released and he knew where the petty cash was kept in the deputy warden's office so he decided he needed some money. So he made the dreadful mistake of climbing over the west wall of the penitentiary and lowering himself down during the night. He got the money and then he went to climb out over the wall again and the rope broke and so he ended up stuck inside the prison and they had one more inmate the next morning than they should have had. He got six months for felonious theft from the prison in a local jail. In terms of the escape, the most, uh, the Red Ryan stuff, yeah. that was, was, was hugely spectacular. It was Austin Kraft, you know, he killed the prison messenger in the front it, it, well, John Kennedy. I think it was, yeah, yeah, and he was recaptured, I think, the same day. And he was the last man to be hanged in the city of Kingston. Yeah. And we found in this huge ledger where they used to document everything that happened from the day that an inmate arrived to the day that he left. The last entry was always something like released on parole yeah. or something. And we found Austin yeah. Kraft, it said, removed from the prison to hang. Yeah. And the water tower on Sir John A, which a lot of people think is the hanging tower, and it never was. No. There was a, a map. If you got away, here's where to go. And the map was wrong. <laughs> and it would guarantee that they'd end up in a swamp. It had circulation in the penitentiary for a number of years. They asked me and they've asked you, I'm sure, you know, where was death row? And there was never a death row no. in the no. penitentiary. No. 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 Forgotten discoveries from the cruel torture of the box and the cat of nine tales, to the inspiration of a Margaret Atwood classic, from faulty escape maps and handmade weapons to an underground network of tunnels, the hidden discoveries of KP never seem to end. It, and one of the things that we uncovered was, uh, you know, we didn't uncover, we discovered, was the tunnel systems to the prison for women. And I know to the warden's residence, actually. Yet that had been all blocked up. Underneath there, there was also, uh, in those tunnels, were cells. These were truly where the sun never shone. Whether they were ever used as cells, we could never determine. There were references in the diaries to the dark cells. To the dark cells. And so we were intrigued by this, and we went through the tunnels trying to find... <laughs> I remember. We remember? tried to find one, and we, we took yeah. a bit. We knew roughly where it was. But they, it is a very intricate system of tunnels under the prison. When we first went down there, there were rats and transformers with, with 550 volt bare terminals on top. It's a pity you couldn't have tours of the tunnels, but if you did, people would get lost because mm -hmm. there are miles of them and every bit of telephone wire and sewage and electricity goes through there, you yeah. know. Prison culture. The balance and hierarchy of the prison culture was an ever-changing, ever-evolving mechanism operated both by senior management as well as a few unlikely figures. The reality of, of a place like KP is that this culture and the subculture and leadership doesn't actually follow hierarchical lines. And so basically I couldn't be the warden without having Pete the Plumber, the most powerful person in the prison. Yes. The senior keeper yeah. who, when I arrived at Kingston Penitentiary, informed me that he'd started to work there the day I was born. 
that's the life of, a, of an institution like, like that. Yeah. And I'm not talking about dirty deals, quite the contrary. No. He was deeply committed to good yes. order. He was deeply committed to decent treatment. He yes. talked a certain kind of bravado. And very well yeah. respected too. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, he was really caught up in the tradition. So part of the book was getting the stories out of people. What is history missing? Despite the massive accumulation of detailed history gathered by Corrections Canada and other historians, many curious mysteries still remain in KP's past. One thing that I think the history doesn't pay enough attention to, the shocking stuff in the reading was the Archambault Report out of 1936, mm -hmm. when there was a riot in 35, and Tim Buck, the Communist Party chief, was actually in prison in what was to become the regional treatment center, which was at that point called the East Cell Block. Guns were shot inside, and several bullets found themselves into his locked cell. Yeah. We never solved that mystery of, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, it was this, you know, kill this communist kind of thing. Was that 1932, the riot? Because, because like the, the, the Archambault Report is an amazing document yes. in terms of documenting what yeah. happened. And we were, you know, able to sort of bring that a little bit in, into context, but th that notion that those things could go, could go wrong mm -hmm. in, in the place. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other part is that the, the mundanity of life generally, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, that's the other part that people tend to, um, to think about. It's all dangerous and you're dealing with the most dangerous people and da 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 da. Corrections isn't about that. Mm -hmm. It's about dangerous people, but when we get them, the job's done. They've got their sentence. Yeah. We put them in the right sort of zone to either protect them, which is what the biggest issue we faced, mm -hmm. or get them to work or get them moving on to get them out. But most of the time, life in there is pretty boring. It's you know? pretty boring, pretty dull. The Warden's House. What is now the prison museum across the street used to be, in fact, the Warden's own residence. The Warden lived across in that, that house until the 1940s or 50s mm -hmm. at least, had a staff of inmates who, you know, they did the house, they did the grounds. There was an apple orchard up there. The warden had a boat. If you go to the southwest gate, mm -hmm. there was a dock. And well before there was legal parameters for the disposal of weapons, if a weapon was done, it just threw it into the lake. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that there's a, still a pile of old weapons down there. Correcting history. Sentences, riots, releases, and deaths are all, of course, documented in the prison records, though some have slipped through the cracks, only to be uncovered by those who dig for them. We uncovered yes, a death, a death that, that had not been documented, right. and one of the things that Corrections was doing in those days, and I give Don Yeomans, the, the former the, the commissioner, due for his support to the book and everything else, was trying to pay some respect to people who had fallen in, in the line yeah. of duty. Mm -hmm. Corrections was struggling to get a list. You know, and so when we, mm -hmm. we, all, we uncovered yes, somebody, we and they end up investigating it and started confirming it, but they basically added the name to, mm -hmm. to the list. The Limestone Boom. Some say that Kingston was built around its prison, particularly because of the 19th century limestone boom, which established much of its architecture, some of it built by the prisoners themselves. There's a lovely church in, in Portsmouth at the top of the hill, which is now sadly closing. And that was built with stone cut and quarried by the inmates, and appropriately it's called the Church of the Good Thief. That's the only way you can build Richardson Stadium, because that's where it came from. So Kingston was full of quarries around the Kingston Penitentiary area. The psychiatric facility was also yeah. built. It was built by inmates. Yes. And it was run under the authority of the warden because at that point it was opened as a provincial penitentiary because it was the government of Upper Canada. So they had both Kingston Pen and the old psychiatric were a single unit and built by, built by the inmates. The inmates were available to cut stone and they cut stone. The original prison. The whole plan was to get a portion of it built and then the remainder of it would be built by inmate labor. Yeah. I think the north wing, there was never any rotunda. The north wing is one cross of a four where yes. they, and they, they built one and then they built the rest of it around. Mm. We never got evidence but it was quite clearly, I mean there were people on the take of some kind. I mean Henry Smith being, being one of them in terms of uh, doing well out of, out of all of this. But yeah, Richardson Stadium is, is the original court. Mm -hmm. Every morning they'd parade a gang of inmates out of the quarry. There were lots of quarries. All of the cast iron, all the steel, 
was forged inside to build St. Vincent de Paul in Montreal. Well, all of the, uh, the original uh, cast iron was, was built, uh, was made at KP and floated up on barges. Most of the people in the early days who worked at Kingston Penitentiary lived in the village of Portsmouth, which was called Hatter's Bay at the time. A boiling point. As the pressures of maintaining a balanced and controlled environment come to a head, from upsets in prison politics to schemes in the general population, many wardens can recall what they refer to as a boiling point. Think about inquests into deaths. Now, by law, if there's something happens inside a penitentiary, uh, if death happens inside a penitentiary, there will be an inquest. That's a fundamental change. And, and so, therefore, changes the name of the game. Uh, and to the good? I think so. Prison is a, uh, it was a contained thing. At times, pressures just boil over, and it's just they explode. It's, a, it's constant balancing. All of these people have broken the law badly enough that they're serving at least two years in a federal penitentiary. So if you get problems in a place like that, like the occasional assault or even murder, you shouldn't really be surprised. 74 riot was as a result largely, or 71 rather, of, of Millhaven Penitentiary opening. The right? fear and apprehension of yeah. going to Millhaven, the new super jail, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. very threatening place. Yes. And of course, unfortunately, the way it opened, the, the prophecy was fulfilled. Mental health versus prison. What has KP taught us about rehabilitation versus punishment? In the beginning, it was much about the latter. While today, the surviving active prisons in the nearby areas strive to improve in matters of mental health. I walked in the first day to Kingston Penitentiary as the head of security. I walked in and I said, it criminalized developmentally handicapped. There's this delightful conceit in society that says, well, you know, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. School doesn't work. Uh, this doesn't work. We'll put them in jail and in 18 months you fix it. That's called rehabilitation. And of course, why do we not succeed? Well, we're given a lot of problems to deal with. Having a prison go on shutdown is just as bad. Like a riot is atypical. It's atypical. You're conscious of it. You're conscious of the cause. But it's representative of something that's gone wrong in that balancing act. You're often uh, parsing things, if you will. You, you know, you're sort of distributing scarce resources between people. Offenders, well, more than anyone, want a stable environment. Yeah. They want a prison that works because they want to get up every morning, go to school, to go to work. They don't want to be running the risk of getting stabbed when they come around a corner. People think that offenders are, they want to blow the place up. No, they don't. They don't. They, they, they are as interested in stability as I am, as a warden. Still if they're running their stable. drug business, they wanted a nice, stable Most environment in which they can do business. Walk around to hear, to listen, to mm -hmm. sense. And your job as a warden is to put A and Q together and say, Mm -hmm. Got to deal with this because something could go wrong. You've got a team that does certain functions and they carry these functions out. But the leadership function is huge inside, inside these things. When KP closed. As the big house was facing its final days, closing, the most serious concern was not what to do with the old building or the land, but the change of environment for the inmates themselves. And it's a real funny mix between mental health and protection. For an inmate who either has a mental health problem or is in protection, any change is extremely threatening to them. They're, they're par they become paranoid, they become very unsure of themselves. They may, might strike out. I, was, I would have not have been surprised over the place. So obviously they manage that transition well in the yeah. close down because you know, that would have been a classic thing where there could have been an assault, a riot. If you recall, the cells faced inward. It was the, yeah, avenue, yeah. the avenue of inspection. They all, they all, yeah, it was all yeah. the Jerry it Bentham's was, concept. They never so. faced outward. The first inmate, Matthew Tavitt, inmate number one, he, he received the lash within a week for, for speaking. Evolution of policy. Minimum, medium, and maximum security are one part of the prison spectrum which KP's evolution has had a lot of responsibility for establishing. As the prison system developed over the years, it became much more differentiated. This was this was part of the recognized the research and the, and the evolution of correctional policy. That, but it was the you know, there are differences. Town, but, yeah, but that's the point. It was the only place. Yeah, it was the only show in town. So you were all treated For the, first. the same. Were trustees developed? Of course, trustees were developed. You always had to have trustees of some kind. In other words, people who like. And just remember as well that that in spite of its contentious nature in public policy. We have had forms of release and parole since about 1880, it's called ticket of leave way back then, and they basically had a similar structure. So inmates were obviously, you know, 
uh, differentiated in kind of fairly subtle ways. But the, the notion of a minimum, medium, maximum grid, which, which came in mm. uh, with the building probably at Collins Bay. If you were a mass murderer or a bank robber, you went to Cape Neal. So then they just thought, this isn't a good idea. So they opened Collins Bay 1932. Yeah. And it was called the Preferred Penitentiary. You know, they were all sort of treated roughly the same. But obviously, if you were going to work on the grounds of the warden's residence, you were a trustee. We can look back and say, oh, well, like, you know, uh, building a place like that, things of that we'd never do that today, da 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 uh, But when it was built, it was built around the Benthamite, Benthamite notion of rehabilitation. So it's isolation, silence, uh, discipline, etc., tended towards some, some forms of brutality. Uh, the notion that uh, the Benthamite concept obviously drove some inmates mad. You know, that sort of thing. Was it a positive notion of social change? Of course it was. Was it wrong? Sure it was. Were there features of it that still endure today? Yeah, and they're there for good reason. Because fundamentally, confinement is part of the mix. As, and humane confinement is part of the mix. Humane is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Okay? Can it go wrong? Sure. Does it, does, it go, does it not go wrong? Most of the time. That's the damn thing is, when it doesn't go wrong, nobody's watching. They're built around models of social change. So look at the Benthamite. Then go back and look at the 1960s model of social change. High level of, of, of intervention mm -hmm. that we never could afford. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> social worker in every cell we used to exactly, say. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, did it work? Uh, I don't know. The correctional service are really doing their best with a very difficult job to accommodate the people they have to accommodate. One of the social changes that is really worth noting, we started to study the flow of, inmate, of, of, of people through the system, through the courts, etc., etc. And that was a time as well when the notion of diversion came into play. That was also the time as well when uh, police started to become much more active in problem solving at the community level called community-based policing. And that, by the way, is mm -hmm. an unsung success in this country. Once they're at prison, they have failed through about five different social grids. Okay? So the, you, we kept pushing back saying, you know, we're not a growth industry. We'd like you to find ways to, to mm -hmm. consider diversion. So you see the emergence of drug courts. You see the emergence of diversion. You see the, the problem solving stuff. The unresolved mess in terms of social change is mental health. Nothing's been done effectively. Mental health has always fallen off the end of the health spectrum in terms of actively doing things. And that's where I think corrections has gotten the rawest of the deals because it's, it's had to deal with, not just as in my, my own personal experience. I, I worked with Dr. Duncan Sinclair, um, who was at that point the Dean of Medicine at, at Queen's, and he and I tried to partner to do, and, and Senator Michael Kirby, who provided some unbelievable leadership on mental, mental health issues. And we thought, could we not invest in, in some change here? Social change-wise, that's, I think, society has to be ashamed of, mm -hmm. of dealing with mental health. End of an era. Now that Canada's most notorious prison is closed, the end of an era, perhaps, what are the positives and negatives of shutting down the big house? Of course it's the end of an era, but tomorrow's the end of another era, Yeah. somewhere mm -hmm. else. So, it's, life goes on. Mm -hmm. so. It's a good thing, because I think, uh, architecturally, it was, it's a sow's ear. I yeah. mean, in relation to... We tried to modernize yeah, it tried to, it, We tried simple. to do things with it over the years, uh, you know, to bring it in line with, you know, keeping with new standards of care and those things. You can only be so responsive when you're dealing with, you know, concrete walls that are three feet thick. You know, it's a it's a task to get a, I, an I, electrical I, plug put in, let exactly. alone do something with it that opens up the concept. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, while there's some nostalgia around it, 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 its time was up. It's the big house, right? No, it's, it's, it's got no the Hollywood there. look. It's always been accepted in the community. It's always been a part of Kingston. Thousands of people drive by it every day. Tourism. Tourism in KP existed even in the early years when it was still active. But much has changed from those spectacles to today's guided tours. You know, there's been, there's been an enormous amount of interest in tours of the prison. Now that it's closed, of course. You know, it's so much so that the, that the website fell apart because so many people were trying to get into it. 
In the early 1900s, anybody could go up to the front door and pay a fee. Take your wife and your children, and you could go in and watch the convicts working, of course, right? And Warden Platt wasn't too thrilled with this. He said, um, I consider it a monstrous cruelty to subject the convicts, they call them that, I think, to, to an endless parade of people. This is not a circus or a sideshow or a menagerie. It's a place of industry. Unknown future. 11 acres of land, dense limestone walls, and a future of uncertainty. What will happen now that the prison is no longer operating? And who decides? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Whatever happens, it's not going to happen very quickly. Except for those who took the tours. I have no conception of the size of this place. You know, you've got 11 acres. You've got huge buildings. So if you're thinking of selling it to a condominium developer and you're going to whip in there tomorrow with a couple of bulldozers and knock it down... Not going to happen. Get it. And then we let, that they let these ideas percolate. There'll be public debate. They, you know, they try mm -hmm. to think it through. Consultation. Some, some of these things are very imagined, very yes. good. Yes. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's great because that'll serve the city well. It's left its correctional uh, role, active correctional role behind. So I think it needs some time to percolate that kind of concept. Sadly, think about think about sorry. the Tet Center and how it's that that concept is brilliant in terms of the new the new uh, 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 performing, performing arts, arts center. center. Yeah. Uh, that I mean that idea took a long time to come to fruition. Um, so it, it it's well worth thinking it through. But then if you look at Rockwood Asylum, which was originally built by the inmates, as the asylum for the insane, because they didn't know where to put insane people. They used to lock them up in Kingston Pen. Rockwood Asylum has been sitting empty for, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years? that's a different years. story. And it's a huge, huge limestone building like Kingston Pen. Not going to know this big, but I hate to think of Kingston Penitentiary suffering the same fate, if you like, just sitting there, you know, like the pyramids and falling apart. And one of the things that becomes really important here is that it's going to, it's, it's not just going to sell it. It's, it's, it's constrained by the fact that it's a designated National Historic Site. So that process, Canada Lands is going to move fairly carefully on that. There's probably going to be, uh, as well, they'll, they'll set up some bidding process, okay, uh, that's going to involve the municipality in terms of being consulted about it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if the municipality stood up and said they'd take it, that might be something that might happen, but it's not going to happen automatically because they have to satisfy themselves. They're not out just to make the money. They're, they have a, a, a mandate, yeah, to get rid of it, to reduce the cost of maintaining it. It won't be corrections making the decision. Mm -hmm. okay? It'll be Canada Land that makes that final decision. So, and it'll go through a long process. Thank you. Thanks. I enjoyed that. If I don't die of loneliness, I may die by my own hand. There'd be no one at my funeral Cause no one gives a damn Yeah, I got 15 years at the big house That's where I belong I don't know no other life I don't know right from wrong I'm doing time at the big house They say I'm here to stay They're gonna try to rehabilitate me A solitary way They're gonna try to rehabilitate me KP way Pretending that 
that you cared But no one was there You're confused and you're scared You convince yourself That nothing really happened You try to tell yourself It was a long time ago Nothing you do helps To take away the pain Cause something big has changed today And it cannot be undone And it will not go away Try rehabilitate me The KB way 